Yeah. Hi everyone, welcome to the Digital Writers Festival. This is the first panel as part of part of the festival. We've been fortunate to um, partner with the DWF this week, and my name is Michelle Coleman. I'm here from Freshly Squeezed, which is a group for aspiring and emerging uh, writers of young adult fiction and uh, helping them to become exposed to other writers, to industry professionals and to teenagers. Today we're talking with a number of publishers and authors about crafting a fantastic and killer first chapter and uh, we'll be talking about all types of fiction today, adult, um, adult to young adult and other types of fiction as well. Um, and we're coming to you physically from Melbourne, which is a wonderful city of literature, and it's a, a lovely hot day here today, um, 36 degrees for those of you coming from other parts of the world. Um, and yeah, we're just excited to be starting off the festival. Uh, we might kick it off, I'll introduce our guest today. Uh, we have uh, Ewan Mitchell, who is a, he has many hats. He is an author, uh, a publisher, he's been a, a senior editor at some major publishing houses, and he is also a lecturer of young adult fiction, so we're very fortunate that his two loves are publishing and educating, so we have him here today. Uh, and I also just have uh, a book that he was he was commissioned to write by the Australian Society of Authors. It's called Your Book Publishing Options, and just to um, give you an example of uh, his skills, um, if I just flick it open to a random page, he's talking about um, the Calgary interface, he really talks about every single aspect of publishing for people. This is an Australian well, version of the book, but I know after reading it that anybody anywhere around the world who is an author looking to publish, even if you have backup behind you, even if you have a publisher or an agent, this is a fantastic resource to know what's happening with your work. Um, you know, from the physical formatting of paper books and e-books and everything like that, to editing, to choosing a publisher, and how you approach them. Um, so we're very fortunate to have him here today. Uh, now, beside him, we have Jane Pearson, who's a, one of the senior editors at Text Publishing. For those of you not familiar with Text Publishing, it's uh, it's classed as a small Melbourne publisher, but it really is the up-and-coming publisher. And a lot of you may have heard of um, a book called The Rosie Project, which is one of the key titles at the moment that's just going gangbusters around the world. I think all publishers are looking for a, a title to hang their hat on, and um, it's, it's a very exciting publishing house text. Um, we have Jane Pearson here, and she's a senior editor there. And uh, last year, she was fortunate to be awarded the Prime Minister, one of the Prime Minister's Literary Awards. I wasn't actually awarded. <laughs> <laughs> she edited a book that was awarded the Prime Minister's Literary Award, so she was a key, a key figure in that. It was Helen Trinker's. Madeline, mm -hmm. uh, which is a story of a, an Australian journalist, Madeline St. John. Um, it's still a, 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 a crowning achievement, really. <laughs> and um, also with us today, we have author and publisher Paul Collins. Um, Paul's been published by a number of publishers um, around the world. He's been published by a number of, of the majors. Uh, his specialty as an author, I guess, is um, science fiction fantasy. Is that a fair? Oh. Uh, he's written the, Je the Jellendor Chronicles, Kentaris Chronicles, Earthborn Wars Trilogy, and he's got about 50 chapter books behind him. But then, in addition to that, he um, has started his own publishing company, and it's 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 really an impressive small publishing company. And if you recognise the name Isabel Carmody, he's been um, fortunate to pick up. She's a big name in Australian literature, and he's been fortunate to pick up um, yeah. her as one of his authors. So well done on that, and well done on the success of the company. Um, and before we start, I actually should mention as well, um, uh, Ewan is a, is a fiction author as well, and he's got um, a semi-autobiographical book that's just yeah. about to come out in the States. Well, it's the global edition. It's just in Amazon, Barnes and Noble, the paperback version. Fantastic, and it's about your travels around Australia when you were just. Hitchhiking around Australia, it came out in Australia in '98, but so it's in American English, a uh, global edition. Mm -hmm. And it's called Feral Tracks. Tracks. Yeah, it's called Feral Tracks, the, the American version, and um, it's it's um, kicker is when freedom comes first. So mm, that looks like a fantastic book. Um, so we might just jump into it, crafting a killer first chapter. Um, in these times, it seems that everyone is incredibly time poor, from agents to editors to readers as well. Um, readers, perhaps more than anyone. Um, 
how essential is it to captivate your audience in that, that first page and that first chapter? Would you like to tell us? Yeah. Well, it starts with the practice of publishers of long known. People look at books in bookstores and start to sample them there. And that's been reinforced by the ebook practice of free sample chapters, mm -hmm. uh, percentage of the book. And while some people might think, well, that's a bit harsh, I've got something really good coming up in uh, chapters four or five, it may be too late. And the publishers will say, well, look, you really need it in those first couple of chapters because we're just reflecting what readers do. Mm -hmm. Have you found it? Well, I think with any book, um, the first chapter is important. It's where the story starts. And for me, reading manuscript after manuscript all the time, um, what I'm looking for yeah, exactly. is a story, mm -hmm. or the promise of a story. Mm -hmm. And if that's not there in the first chapter, then that first impression is not there. And then to read on, that's got to be overcome. So I think that, you know, of course the first chapter is mm -hmm. important. Um, you, you're engaging the reader. This is where your relationship starts. Um, wow, the <laughs> and for uh, What a lot of people don't realise is that Publishers can get up to maybe 2,000 submissions a year. And unless you're going to have that killer first chapter, they don't have the chance to, uh, to go past even the first few, uh, few pages, really. Because there's no way knowing they're going to read a book that they do not have time to read if they know they're not going to publish it. The writing's not there, it's not engaging, it hasn't got an original turn of phrase. Um, it's, got to be, it's got to foreshadow what's to come. And there's, uh, like we'll talk about it later, perhaps uh, those first liners. You know, even yes. the first line can suddenly make a, an editor's ears pick up and think, oh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Just just even in, in a couple of lines. Just just on that, I mean, do you really, I know that, we'll, uh, you know, listening to agents and editors, I mean, is it really from the first line that you do feel it? Can I go? Yeah. <laughs> um, it doesn't have to be, but if there is a first line that, the magic can start right there, and that is that is wonderful when that happens. Um, I've got a stack of books in front of me because they've all got great openings. Um, each year at Text, we run the Text Publishing Prize for a young adult manuscript, and as Paul said, there is so much reading. We get about 300 um, entries. It's a huge job to read them all. And whilst nobody, no manuscript gets chosen or thrown out on its first line or even its first page, if there is a first line there, that grabs you. Okay, so, I'm going to stop yeah. you there because um, you have said that no manuscript gets thrown out on its first page, which perhaps is a little bit contradictory to what writers are hearing from other people and, and maybe particularly when we're talking about approaching agents. I, I mean, it, it, I think agents have... have more or less been admitting. I mean, you get one page to impress them, and if you if you haven't impressed them in that one page, then it's then it's out the pub. Are publishers a little more patient? Well, I I don't think I've thrown anything out on a first page, but I've certainly got a good idea of what I'm reading on that first page. Um, I'd like. I think I, manuscripts would get two to three pages <laughs> before that that. Um, it, it's all been discarded. But having said that, the first page is where you start to form your opinion. And there's always a chance that there's just, you know, it's going to come together, so you know, you give the manuscript a little bit more. But then there's all that work for the manuscript to do to get over that. Mm -hmm. So I don't I don't think I've thrown anything out on the first page. I've probably put a lot of things aside on a first page and maybe never got back to them. But um, it's not just the first page, but if the first page isn't, um, if the first page is flat and dull, then chances are I'll be really like that. So. And, and in your experience, how long, at your particular publishing house at Fort Street Publishing, how, how long does someone get? Uh, not very long, <laughs> for the simple reason that at the moment I'm close to submissions. Mm -hmm. I, have been, I mean, I, I, I can do maybe a dozen, 15 books a year. Mm -hmm. So once I've got those, I don't want to work on next year's books. I'm struggling to give up okay. this year's books. So um, basically, if someone sends me a manuscript, they haven't checked the guidelines on the website to start because they've sent a manuscript to a publisher that says we're close to mm -hmm. submissions. Um, but presumably you open them once a year if you're not. Presumably that's the way it could work. <laughs> right, right. 
<laughs> if I've got a dozen books and I'm just yeah. struggling to keep up with them, yeah. I haven't got that much time to read other issues. What I do for authors, though, is um, I get interns coming in from various um, um, universities, so colleges, etc., and I get them to read and give assessments. Yeah. So you know, I don't just throw it out because mm -hmm. uh, I can't take time. I can't and, be bothered. It's and is it their job to read the entire manuscript or the entire three chapters? Sometimes or? they sometimes they read at least three or four chapters. Mm -hmm. um, I've got an intern at the moment reading a manuscript that was sent to me. Um, it was about 200 pages. I don't have the time to read it, so I gave it to an intern. And uh, interns are quite just because they're interns doesn't mean that they don't know what they're doing. They're, mm -hmm. they're quite good. Okay, so and has anyone then come off that slush part where an, an intern said to you, actually, this is quite good? Um, probably one or two in um, about seven or eight years okay. that I've, uh, I've been publishing where if someone says to me, this is really good, mm -hmm. and they can't find a flaw with it, obviously mm -hmm. I'm not going to just knock it back. I mean, that's why I don't just send them straight back. I mean, someone, someone might send me a thing and I say to them, look, we're, we're close to submissions, and they might say, well, if you know that, why didn't you send it back to me three months ago? <laughs> the fact is, I do not want to throw out anything that I haven't at least had an intern yeah. look at. But I, I can tell you one thing while, while I've got it here. I, I've typed these out. Um, one thing, I don't know whether you guys have this opinion, but when I see a manuscript that's submitted to me like that, okay. um, single well, single-space lines, a small print, not, not Times New Roman, not that it has to be Times New Roman, four point, but, you know, um, and there's no identifier up here. Sometimes they don't even have page numbers. They obviously haven't done their own work. There's no paragraphs. I think to myself, it's going to be awful. So you look at those finer points of the, the grammar, the presentation, and immediately you've got an idea of this, whether this person knows in the industry. Well, I, I think so. I think that's a mm -hmm. fair indication. I mean, some people, I'm sure, can send a, a manuscript on um, you know, in butcher's paper, and uh, if it's that good, <laughs> someone's going to pick up. In fact, there are stories about some authors who have actually sent stuff that's, you know, you, you take one look at it and you think this is shocking. So you're telling me you would still read this, but your immediate impression before you're reading it is negative? They've got, so got some demerit points straight okay, away. Okay. Um, I mean, basically, that's the way to do it. You know, that's the way we do it Some sometimes. You, you might have mm -hmm. indents and not have that. It's just this saves And irrespective of whether you're sending it in paper version or digital version, it's right. I, th I think so. It just shows a certain level of uh, professionalism, mm -hmm. um, and that's that's even before you sort of really read the manuscript. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you find? Yeah, the uh, submission like, guidelines. Ford Street have got their own. Text have got their own. But just looking at that, I get quite a few manuscripts sent to me, and as soon as they said there are single space lines, I'm thinking, well, they can't follow basic instructions, and it's really important when you're working with an author with over many months, it can be years. Of, you can actually work cooperatively and they can follow instructions and you can go back and forth. So that, that's a, 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 a really important thing. You've got to check the submission guidelines, publish it. And they vary. I mean, texts take hard copy. I think the mm -hmm. first two or three chapters yeah. out of the number take electronic copy or Wall Street take. Um, I prefer the printed copy because I don't want to sit there and yeah. start printing them out. I don't want to read them on the screen, so I do prefer the printed copy. But it's going back to that first page. Uh, with uh, I implore my students. Uh, I teach fiction writing as well, and a couple of them have been published by Text Publishing. That first sentence is the GOS, the Great Opening Sentence, and you sweat on that. You've got to make it uh, a killer, and we've got some examples coming up. I believe there's a few examples. So we'll illustrate it. But uh, from a writer's point of view, don't think you have to have that GOS before you can write anything else. It may be something you add way down the track, and possibly even when you finish the book, you add that great sentence. So don't see it as something you have to uh, nail before you go. You're just putting too much pressure on it. Can, so, can I pick up on that? I think that's a really good point, this um, idea of not getting that first sentence necessarily right at the beginning, because one sense I get reading um, first chapters is that writers, in a way, are writing themselves into a story. And they might have a few, a beautiful scene or a few phrases that you can tell that um, they're very happy with. Mm -hmm. like a lot. Um, and then their story takes off from there. And I reckon that what happens in a lot of cases is that's there and that's the beginning. And that's held very dear to the author because that's where they started. And yet the story went to somewhere wonderful. And maybe that's not the most, maybe that's not the best opening anymore. And yet you can be a little bit blind to that because it's the baby, it's where it started. So I think coming back when you've finished your 
manuscript, and you've redrafted it, of course, very many times. Um, and looking at that opening mm -hmm. is, is a really good thing to do. Mm -hmm. And that maybe the whole lot of it goes. You know, that's something I think that we well, should get on something like that. Um, with writers, it is true. You fall in love with particular mm -hmm. particular sentences, which you really think um, personify the, 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 the mm -hmm. best part of your voice as a writer. And this is something that um, that publishers, editors, agents always go on about. It's it's the voice. It's picking up and hearing the voice. So you're saying where we have these sentences where we love in the opening, you're, you're thinking that it's a particular point where we can also fall down at in falling in love with those sentences and thinking they're showing off the best of our writing when in fact we need to be a little bit more critical. I think so. It is very hard for writers to be critical of their own work and I think that's the way the industry, why the industry is structured the way it is with editors. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what one of the things we're here for. However, um, you can't be rely, you know, don't rely on your editor. Um, but trying to read critically and being prepared to um, throw stuff at you, like, you know, kill your darling. Yeah. <laughs> um, I might go back to the point that you actually raised, you and um, in terms of the difference now. Well, when people traditionally walk into a bookshop, they click open a book. They we've been told again and again. They read the first paragraph. They read the second paragraph. You might be lucky to get a page from a reader, but really they'll, they'll make a decision pretty early. Is that changing now with people downloading their first chapters for free? Do, do we as writers get more time? Well, I think it's reinforcing that practice. Okay. If you're going to get 10, 20 percent, and it's a fantastic thing. You can have a paper delivered on a Sunday morning, look at the reviews, and sit there with your iPad or your Kindle or whatever you're using, and actually check out the free downloads. And I would do that more now mm -hmm. and check out more books because I've got more time. Mm -hmm. Rather than uh, I wish I had more time. Do you give them? Sorts. Do you give them more time to be to, to oh, come yeah. into their own? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And because uh, you're more relaxed, if you're standing in the bookstore, you know, so yeah. looking at one, you know, is this person going to flog this book or something like that? Um, so it's absolutely crucial. Uh, just want to add something to what Jane said. One of the things I learned in making short stories is often you just say, you know, cut out the first two paragraphs, and that's where the story starts. <laughs> yeah. And maybe by the time you've actually finished the book, there is a better starting point. Mm. Uh, and there's a lot of reading up that can go be yeah. on when you're actually writing. So uh, can we go on the hook thing? Uh, uh, before we start, yeah. can I just uh, interrupt? We've got um, Vicky Renner, who's one of the freshly um, squeezed reads administrators behind us, and she's got a question coming through on Twitter. Yep, this question is from uh, McKay, from at Michaela K. Uh, what deserves the most focus in a first chapter? The protagonist, the world, the foreshadowing, the action, etc. So, what deserves the most focus? <laughs> well, it depends on the, the storyline. I mean, is it an action-based um, story? If it is, then obviously your first line might. Um, reflect what the story is going to be. In, in a book of mine, uh, Mole Hunt, uh, the first line is something like, um, someone was going to die and it wasn't going to be Maximus Black. <laughs> um, <laughs> straight away, um, it, it's what they call a puzzle book, basically. It, it um, reflects that it's an action story. Obviously, there's going to be murder in there, uh, a bit of a mystery. And um, you're throwing in your protagonist. You're, you're throwing in the, the protagonist. Uh, and you know exactly what that book's going to be like just from that, that first line or two. So essentially your answer is is more that as opposed to doing a number of things quite well, actually you need you need all of it in there but done in a, a subtle and sophisticated manner. Exactly right. Yeah. But I think Michaela's question is really interesting because there's a lot of things that that opening line or opening chapter <coughs> excuse me, needs, needs to do and should do. But I think it's, it can be a trap for writers to fall into the, um, the mindset of, okay, what do I need to do? What does this need to achieve? What are the technical things I need to be addressing here? I, I feel that while all those things are important, the best thing a writer can do is almost forget them, at least for, some, for the first draft, and tell the story. I mean, you, your, your book, your novel, whatever it might be, has a story to tell. You're engaging with the readers through telling them that story. So what you want to do is, is tell it. And I think there are various technical do's and don'ts that are probably worth thinking about. But the main thing is tell your story. 
get in there and sort and of just do it. Don't be overwhelmed by thinking it needs to be all of these things. Just yeah, I think it's it's probably worth thinking about those later yeah. on down the track. If you had a choice between, yeah. say, world building and protagonist though in your first chapter, is it always protagonist? Very scary. <laughs> <laughs> always. <laughs> Often. Probably. Yeah, okay. yeah I agree with you. Yeah. I think it's really important for readers to be for the protagonist. The intrigue, absolutely important. One of my favourite opening lines it was a bright cold day in April and the clocks were striking 13. Mm -hmm. It's George Orwell's name, yeah. of course. You just want to paint what the what? top like, what, what's going on here? So they question that. But for me, I come down on the side of empathy for the protagonist straight up. There are three tried and true techniques that all this use. There's uh, show them a situation of suffering, pain, uh, show them with a sense of humour, or show them as a part of a family. There are others, but they are the three main ones. And it's so important, straight up, that you've got the reader barracking for that protagonist. Mm, yes. um, so they feel for the protagonist, and then whatever conflict you th then throw that just protagonist into, that they've got an emotional connection. Yeah, so they can put themselves in the protagonist's shoes, and that's what empathy is. So if you open, say, uh, the protagonist being rejected or humiliated or suffering some sort of loss, great, right? okay, we can pick it up while it's happening there, we can understand that. Or if they're very funny, take a character like Shrek at the start, where he's screwing up a book and he's in the outhouse and then having a bath and what looks like, you know, liquid uh, feces and, and he's blowing bubbles in the water out the back. It's all human designed to get in there. Or the other very common one, a member of a family, and those three can simply uh, just use time again. Mm -hmm. I actually had a bet once with uh, a colleague at university. He said, oh, that's not right. They won't do that. And uh, I said, right, we're at the library here. You pick any book <laughs> on the first page. And he was so furious that he lost the bet. He put down about a dozen books, and there was one of those three elements on the first page of every one yeah. he chose. Yes, yeah. so, and I think that the, the yeah. famous spring writing book, Save the Cat, that so many um, authors now follow, where it establishes the same, the same thing. That yeah. The protagonist saves the cat on the, in the first paragraph, and then from then on, you can do anything with the protagonist. Yeah. <laughs> there are certain rules. I, I have a similar thing with students when I do this 12 point structure of fantasy. Um, some kids say to me, oh, I've got two heroes. I say, no, you can't have two heroes. Why not? Oh, well, because take a look at Lord of the Rings, take a look at Aragorn, take a look at, and you rattle off you know, all the classic you know, Harry Potter. So you've got one, um, one hero. I said, you want to try and break the rules, that's fine, but I can't think of any examples. Uh, it's a bit like when um, character um, in Psycho gets killed. You, know, you can say to people, well, the character, the main character never gets killed off. So mm -hmm. if you're going to kill them off, it's at the end before Psycho. There's always one example mm -hmm. where someone can say, yeah, but, mm -hmm. but generally speaking. Well, that's an interesting thing. I think um, George R. R. Martin's on the well where he does have multiple heroes, and then he does have the leeway to kill off people and still have you attached <laughs> to the story. However, he is a master of writing. He's a master of the genre. So Perhaps for those of us who are aspiring and emerging, perhaps the lesson to be taken out of that is don't break the rules potentially with your first book unless you know you're doing it very well. Perhaps going with something that, that still has a, something unique, but, or no, or is this, no, or should, we, should no, we be no, pushing the barrier? Can I add to that? When you are choosing the narrator, don't use the second person, you. That is very hard to do. Nicky Gamble did it well on a bride strip there, so I can get up in the morning. And Put a change of clothes on, you go out the door, it's you, 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 second person. You're either going to write the first person, I did this, I did that, or the third person, he or she did this, mm -hmm. that, etc. So being too clever, too early, can really work against you. Excellent. We might move on, unless, do we have any more questions at this? Not this stage. Okay. Well, we might move on to book and talking about the book and, and looking at the books in, in your particular books. For your non-fiction, your publishing book, for me, the book is that the Australian Society of Editors commissioned you to write it, and I think that's almost a hook that you use when you're giving your classes as well. Um, you know, a hook can be many things. It can be a marketing line, it can be it can be so many things. Would, would anyone like to, to talk about the hooks? Can I just make that distinction um, between a marketing hook, yeah. and it could be, I don't know, Bridget Jones's Diary, Pride and Prejudice for Our Times. There's a marketing hook. But the hook in a story is something else, and it's what we were talking about earlier. Yeah. And a great example of Paul Go. You want to know well, what happened after that first sentence? Yes. Yeah. What happened? And that's a great example. Yeah. I've got, I've got um, I've jotted some things down here. There's um, various hooks uh, the puzzle hook, the dialogue hook, 
the voice hook, the character hook, the action scenic, and setting in time, the philosophical hook. I've got examples here if uh, you want Please, to that would be lovely. So it's the who, what, when, where, why, and how. Okay. So uh, once I was living in an orphanage in the mountains, and I shouldn't have been, and I almost caused a riot. It was because of the carrot, and that was a nice flat one. Um, dialogue, uh, dialogue hook. Uh, where's Papa going with that axe? Said Fern to her mother, oh, as they were setting the table for breakfast. And so starting with dialogue, which I, from my experience of reading my own work and other people's work, is actually quite a difficult thing to achieve a good dialogue hook. Starting with dialogue, because you need to. You need to be learning something about the character who's speaking through the dialogue, really, because if it's if it's something that doesn't really give a lot of atmosphere, it, it can fall a little flat sometimes. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got to be good at what you do, and hopefully editors will actually make it work <laughs> if it's interesting. So from, from that dialogue book, uh, we learned that it was a, a child. Yes. Uh, looking on and not understanding an adult situation and there was a tension in the adult situation with the axe. It's got a few so things happening there. It's, it's fantastic, it's great. Yeah. Can I say that the, the key there is the subjects, the hidden agenda. What's he doing with the axe? Yeah. That, he's, he's not saying, well, it's but as well. he's not announcing what, what's about to happen. Mm -hmm. and that's the key. But all those uh, dialogues that are a little bit not quite so good, putting subjects in the hidden agenda is usually the key time for that. Mm -hmm. like that stuff is good. Yeah. We've got uh, the voice hook. Um, change tiptoed into our lives with her eyes down like a shy chick coming late to class. That was Mike Johnson in uh, Cliff Heads. And what was that? So that's, you that's voice. that the voice hook? Oh, that's that good voice the sense of beautiful literary. Yes. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, the character hook. Call me Zitz. Everybody calls me Zitz. <laughs> that's not my real name, of course. My real name isn't important. And that was in Flight, Sherman uh, Alexei in Flight. There's the action hook, which I use in uh, the Maximus Black files. This is another. This is the third book in the series. Uh, somebody was trying to kill Maximus Black. Somebody good. Maximus quickened his pace slightly, but otherwise gave no sign he was being followed. His internal senses, the biotactical implants wired into his basal ganglia, confirmed what his gut told him. His tracker had sped up as well, though he still hung well back. Um, and that gives you an indication of what's happening there. Mm -hmm. It gives you the uh, well, basically, it's the action, mm -hmm. action hook. Um, scenic hook, that sets the uh, scene. In the middle of a great sprawling grey city was a place that no human had ever entered. It looked like a trackless wilderness humped up at the centre and edged in tangled bushes knitted together by a winding creeper. Sometimes people talked of getting rid of the wilderness, but it was almost impossible for humans to think about it long enough to act. That was Isabel Carmody. Um, a little fur. Is that uh, one of the ones that you No, I, I've actually contracted three as a book kind of books. Um, they are reprints from Penguin. Yes. So um, I've got Greyland, Scatlings, and Alison Whitestar. Yeah, fantastic mm -hmm. titles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, that, and that's a beautiful title there. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're still sort of uh, pretty current, the little fur books. Mm -hmm. um, setting uh, in time, Kingsley Ward's Wolfishness was a problem. If it weren't the howling, it was the occasional desire to bite boorish people. Which was really acceptable, no matter how boorish the bore. If 1908 was going to be a good year, however, he would have to maintain his control, and it was his turn to walk onto the stage of the Alexander Theatre. And that's Michael Pry in uh, the Extraordinary. So immediately, the author in that one has established what year it is. It just just set it out loud and um, and and set uh, done some world building set around the stage. That, but, yeah. Who knows exactly what's happening? The uh, philosophical. Hook is a meditation of ideas and thoughts and opinions. Um, it is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of good fortune must be in want of a wife. So, Jane, that's good thoughts. So, yeah, so there, there's some of, the, uh, some of the hooks that you can sort of rely on. I think there's some good ones there. Yeah, and um, the thing that's in common across all of those is there's the promise of a story. You want to find something out, there's more to tell. Um, and getting that sense of intrigue for the reader, no matter how it's done, is so important because there's no way if you picked up any of those first chapters, you're going to stop after those ones. There's right. just just no way. Um, can I talk so what a great what a great start. Can I talk about then when 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 manuscripts land on your desk, whether they're through an agent or whether they're through the slush pile or um, through students or fellow authors? Um, what are the common problems with hooks? I, I know 
just from my own experience that maybe sometimes too much hook is a problem, too many elements, is that is that something that you see or is it, is it not enough hook really the, the main problem that you see? Look, I don't think I've ever read anything and thought, gee, that hook, there's too much hook or there's not enough hook or whatever. Um, the whole concept of a hook, I think, you forget about if it's there. If it's there, you're reading, you're away. You're, 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 not thinking, you're intrigued. You've you're got a hook, I'll tick you in that box. Um, and you may, you may um, not even think about it to, you know, for ages. Mm -hmm. but, and that's the way you want writing to work. You don't want all the nuts and bolts and how you've done things to be there in a you know, checklist at the front. Otherwise, you could just supply that here. I'll, I'll tick the boxes, mm -hmm. I've got all these things. Um, you want the story to take off and you want the reader to forget everything else they're doing or they have been doing or they're going to do later and mm -hmm. have them turning that page. Sure. Yeah. And, and you, you're probably exposed to writers at all stages of their career as opposed to Jane who's exposed to writers who have finished manuscripts at least. You are <laughs> <laughs> um, you're, um, you're helping them get to that final stage and, and develop an understanding of those techniques and then put them in subtly so they, so they don't um, distract from the reading. In so terms of hook, where do you see problems with your writers? Too much description and not enough conflict. Okay. Um, well, I can give you an example of uh, the first team I had published with text who had written the first uh, few chapters at the Box Hill Tate in Novel 1. Um, and you might even remember this if you've seen Nikki Reed's Unzipped. Mm. Ten reasons why that wasn't sex last night. And <laughs> no one's <laughs> <laughs> so Just a, a fantastic yeah. book. But there's a lot of uh, description, and it might be a beautiful scene on uh, a boat, on a tropical sea, etc. And it goes on and on, and there's not enough conflict. And really, at the risk of sounding like a, a year 12 English teacher or a drama teacher, Drama is conflict and conflict is drama. You've got to have some sort of conflict. There's some opposition. Or, or, uh, or even um, conflict is one way to put it. Tension is yeah, another tension. way to put it. Like yeah. some kind of that, play. That of, yeah. yeah. And it, it doesn't have to be two people arguing or anything like that. It could be uh, asking a question, uh, but there's got to be some sort of uh, drama very early on. Mm -hmm. Not just a whole lot of description. And sometimes you get pieces that sound a little bit like uh, they've got their smoking jackets on and they're going along. Do you read it? In this book, and there's this whole lot of, uh, I observe them, uh, it, it, they're just really grabbing their engines rather than really jumping and writing from the heart. Mm -hmm. and I know it's a pleasure to sound uh, to say that, but I see a lot of students who read the classics, the canon of literature, and think, right, I'm going to stand on their shoulders and here I go. Not really writing about what they're passionate about and they feel strongly about it. and that comes through on the page. So uh, if it's a bit of a false writing, if it's a bit of a pastiche, uh, meaning that reflecting other people's writing that comes through, that can be a problem as well as uh, not enough uh, conflict and too much description. Mm -hmm. And uh, did you want to go over any of the starts of, of your books or the books in your books? Oh, can I read a couple of them? Of course you may. <laughs> Not to get them. Um, as it happens, a couple of these are from the um, text prize where they've had to stand out from uh, among 300 others. Uh, I remember reading the first line of this book, The Bridge by Jane Higgins. And I don't know if I quite said it, but you know, I thought, I think I've got the winner on the first line. Now, that's not to say first line is enough to win the prize, but it's a very short first line. We rode to war in a taxi cab. Wow. Okay, I was reading on from there. There was no question about that. And, um, and it's it's quite a simple. It's simply phrased. Mm. She's not working to get a lot of voice in or to, sh to no, show off or no. to No, there's just there's something going on there, and it's well war. Um, so that there's there's going to be a lot going on there. But the taxi cab, how mm. it's going on there? Something something interesting. Mm. Why, you know, why? And why did they go to war? You know, I don't know. I'd be, Probably the one hiding in the right the way. Um, this is another text prize winner, The Minnow by Diana Sweeney, and this um, starts with the main character speaking directly to the author. I think Bill is in love with Mrs. Peck. I can buy it to an undersized blue swimmer crab that has become all tangled up in my line. 
The little crab doesn't appear to be the slightest bit interested, so I finish pulling it free and toss it over the side of Bill's dinghy. I think you're going to get the whole paragraph, sorry. It makes a plopping sound as it enters the water, and I watch it swim away. Bill, as usual, is asleep. He sleeps with his hand dangling over the edge, the line tied to his little finger. Sometimes I have to kick him awake, although he swears he always feels the fish tugging off. That's Bill, a bit of a liar. Um, the main character in, in this in this book has the most delightful uh, most delightful voice, mm -hmm. but she speaks to fish, and that's how you learn about her throughout throughout the book. Um, that I found that first. Um, so it came in like that in, in current tense, and with that. As I heard it touch in that paragraph, but I'm you know maybe had a little tweak. Um, it's. Um, there's something about that character that just captured me in that in that opening line, and I think there was the op the opening um, about Mrs. Peck, whoever she might be, um, but the final comment on the end was Bill, a bit of a liar, and you instantly know there's going to be something something odd going on with Bill, and believe me, there really <laughs> there really is. <laughs> um, yeah, that's wonderful. Did you want to read the others or? Um, or we can get on to that. I, I might just read this one. Another text prize winner, not published yet, but um, this is the winner from last year that will be published later in the year, called How to Be Happy. And it's a non fiction memoir. Um, and I think it's it's got a pretty strong hook in the first, in the first line. Oh, in the chapter heading in the first line. The book's called How to Be Happy by David Burton, chapter one. I've lied to you already. I don't know how to be happy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next slide. Yes, yeah, sorry, awkward. <laughs> um, I don't know. Yes, uh, and this this book is um, an account of his extreme unhappiness, I guess, through his his teenage years and how he came through that. And it goes to some really bleak and dark places, right to the right to the brink brink of suicide. It's terrifying. Um, and yet there is a, a warmth and uh, a lot of humour in it and you get that right from the first line. Speaking directly like, to you like you're a friend. Exactly. Yeah. And it's it's the, it's so honest mm -hmm. and, um, and I think get that honesty in that first one too. Thank you. Um, thank you for that. Um, uh, in terms of those, they're very strong starts, they're great opening hooks, they're great first chapters and great first lines, but then just looking a little, uh, the competition that we're running in conjunction with this is a first chapter competition. If somebody has that, they've got the great start, they intrigue you, they've got you turning that page, what does, how does that first chapter need to build, does it need to build to something? Does it need to build to a question or can you talk a little bit about that? Well, there's no point having a great opening if that's all you've got, obviously. So the story, the story has to deliver. Your opening is the promise to the reader. There is something here that you, you want to read. I'm going to take you on a journey, transport you somewhere. And then it has, has mm -hmm. to do that. Um, in terms of where um, first chapters can take you and where they end, this book, um, Alex as well by Lisa Brookman, came in... You know, she sent it in to me. Um, at that stage, for some reason, I wasn't reading on an iPad, so I printed it off and I went to the printer and I started reading it as it came off the printer. <laughs> <laughs> you were standing at the printer. And the first chapter, the first chapter, the first page, yep, it had something in it. Um, it's the story of a transgender girl, a uh, boy girl of around 14, um, really struggling with her gender identity and her sexuality and moving between her male self and her female self in a way that makes you think in that opening chapter that there's actually two people called Alex. And the way those two people come to come to be one right on the final line of that first chapter absolutely blew me away. I, I stopped breathing. <laughs> um, then the book the book goes on from there. So, you know, it's more than just, you know, but this book, the, the main um, stunning thing was the, the end of the first chapter, even though it opened brilliantly. So yeah. building to a question, but building to a resolution in some ways, and that resolution is surprising and unpredictable and... Yeah. This, I guess it was resolving one thing, you know, oh, you were a bit wrong-footed, mm -hmm. um, and now you know, but oh my God, where does this take you, you know? So, um, uh, so still, that promise of something 
something exciting to come out, something you need to know more about. Yeah. And very, you know, in this case, incredibly confronting. Yeah. yeah. Um, Paul, I might ask you about your own writing. In uh, obviously amazing starts, is there anything particular that you build up to with that first chapter, or is it more that you're taking the moment action right, and as long as there's that action in there? That's enough. I try and keep the pace going. Mm -hmm. I don't actually, um, as, as Jane said before, there were no real golden rules. Mm -hmm. um, you, you tell a story. Mm -hmm. and I don't always end on a hooker. I've got a new series coming out with Sean McMullen, a collaborator on a fantasy series called Warlock's Child. Now, each of those, there, there were six books in a row coming out in eight or six months. And the, um, the end of all those stories have to have a hook. Yes. Because they're just mm -hmm. like chapters, really, and, and you need you want the person to read the next chapter, yeah. so the next book. Uh, so in, in that situation, obviously you need you need that to build up to something, mm -hmm. the expectation of what's to come. Mm -hmm. I think if you're writing in a novel, I don't actually take any notice of where that is winding up. That winds up that chapter. You've changed scene or whatever. You're moving on to the next chapter. And then I'll move on to the next chapter. Mm -hmm. So I don't actually follow any mm -hmm. certain rules of, oh, this has to build up to a crescendo this first chapter. Yeah. And you're obviously getting so you get you get them right, so it, it, it has a natural flow for you as an author. When you're teaching people from the start, is is there more of a guideline in there for your first chapter? Yeah, I, I think of that first, well, I say a little bit the opposite to Paul. 25% normal world set up. You've got to set up a normal world that's going to be thrown out of balance. You've got to give a reason for the hero or heroine to commit to the journey, which is going to happen in Act 2. And uh, I know it sounds very formulated, but it's not. It's a framework. It's been used over and over again. The original one was uh, going back to Homer and the Odyssey and the journey back to Ithaca. And so the protagonist is reluctant to go on that journey, but eventually they make a non-page commitment. It might be a deal. It might be... Shrek again, uh, when the archers are looking at him about to shoot him, if he doesn't agree to know, I can get the princess behind him. And then the journey begins, and that's where the real learning uh, begins. It doesn't have to be that way, you can do a tragedy and have it uh, work out a different so, way. So you'd advise them to come back to the archetypes as they're learning, put those factors in, maybe go back in the drafting and, and you, can, you can play with it. Someone like Paul, and I, I know a lot of experienced authors who are just fantastic at what they do. They, they actually do these things, but it's just inherent in what they do. They just understand the concept of story work so well that it just yeah. it just flows without having to break it down into those points. But it's great to have it um, broken down as well. Usually as a diagnostic tool, we can come back to those sort of things because I've seen so many authors get halfway through a book, get demotivated, I'm not sure where I'm going, and we go back and we dig deeper into the protagonist. What do they want? What's their desire? I know these sound like basic things, but what is the goal? What is their overriding goal? What's their character flaw? It's usually a character flaw. Uh, what do they need to learn? Those uh, three things are very important. And so that transition from Act 1 to Act 2, I can use that in the normal world and the new world. And I should say that the new world doesn't have to be in another planet or uh, country. It can be a new set of relationships within a world. Uh, but going on that journey that really tests the protagonist, uh, that's where I'd be thinking you've got to learn from that great opening, you've got to be thinking of that next major plot point. It's sometimes called the inciting incident, sometimes the hook is called the inciting incident, I call it the opening crisis, but um, some people call it plot point one. Whatever you want to call it, it's when Act 1 moves into Act 2 and the reluctant protagonist finally commits to that journey. In films, typically happens between 22 and 25 minutes. Yeah, like it's very under minute very If you watch it, it happens like that, yeah. that and it's ingrained in us yeah. and, uh, through the Western tradition. See, I, I'd use that structure with, with fantasy, that 12-point structure. Mm -hmm. you know, there's the call to adventure, the refusal to the call to adventure, the mentor comes in, etc. Um, but yeah, I'm not so sure that I'd follow it with other uh, stuff. I, I just the story. Oh, yeah. And with that's fantasy, I do make sure that, I mean, you, you get kids and um, they write a story and say, well, where's the mentor? Oh, there's no mentor. I say, yeah, well, the mentor's supposed to give them a kick up the bum and get them on the road to adventure. And, uh, you know, where's the crossing, the, the new threshold, and blah, blah, blah. And, of course, then they say, oh, is that where it's gone wrong? Oh, OK. So then they'll uh, quickly write something else. Well, the best book I've read lately is The Narrow Road to the Deep North and it breaks all those yeah. rules. And it's absolutely brilliant. That is, I said, when you're starting off, it's good to have those touchstones and sort of what, what's been proven to work out. Yeah. So Look, I think that as much as everything you're saying is true, there's a little bit of a danger here. <laughs> um, I think pro it's probably great to have 
all of that there for when something's not working, that you can go back and think, well, maybe I'll think about it in those terms and maybe um, plots, uh, point six of the 12 point is some area that I can think about and expand on. But I think all of these things need to be um, secondary to the story you want to tell and maybe in the story you want to tell there was no mentor or maybe there was, I don't know, no point where, no point seven or, or whatever. Um, that's fine. Now if your story's just not working then obviously you've got to look at very, you know, many angles. And there's probably, an, there is an enormous amount to, um, to learn from what it's, um, it's talking about. What we're hearing uh, here from you is a little bit of a reflection of, of what you do and the type of um, literature you do. And text has a really strong literary tone mm. that comes through all of, all of its text. And it's, it's beautiful. The voice is always beautiful when you read a textbook. <laughs> and is there a little bit more leeway in terms of if you're writing that, that strict literary versus if you're writing commercial kind of genre of fiction that you, you have a bit more leeway to take your character to different places and not, not sort of meet a, a certain set of expectations? Well, I think if you're doing, whatever you're doing, if you're doing it well, it's great. Yeah. If you're not pulling it off, then it's not working. Um, and I'm, oh, whoever would like to answer this one, um, the, the, obviously the publishing industry is changing. We're all, uh, we're all racing to keep up with it. Um, if we just delve into um, YA fiction in particular, do you feel there's a change in, uh, I guess as from a writer's perspective, it, there's always been a certain um, conservative tradition with YA fiction in, in some ways, you know, perhaps in Australia particularly in getting books into schools, maybe there are certain topics that are difficult to touch and they need to be, um, uh, we need to approach them in certain ways, you know, sex is obviously one, drugs, if it's approached in a certain way you can get it across the line but you can't just include it as atmosphere or, you know, you, there's a certain conservative tradition for YA. With the change in dynamic and with the, the change, do, do teenagers have more power now in terms of buying books and is, uh, are, are, the, are the guidelines being broken down? Can we get different stuff over the line now? I think with um, my, my own opinion from Ford Street saying was that our biggest market really is the schools. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to penetrate the book sales, okay. uh, even though I've got Macmillan distribution and uh, the biggest sales are happening in schools and libraries, etc. And uh, let's face it, it's the adults that are actually buying those books mm -hmm. uh, for us. Uh, for a major publisher or a bigger publisher that has their own sales force, etc., you've got that penetration into the marketplace and people will buy the books from the stores. But you could walk into any bookshop in Australia and the chances are only one in ten will have a Fourth Street book, mm -hmm. even though I've got current books right now. Mm -hmm. So, in other words, um, the, the censorship that you have, and that it is censorship, is that the buyers um, don't want their kids to be reading such and such. So, for example, uh, we published a book called Crime Time, Australians Behaving Badly. And it was sort of a companion novel to what my partner wrote for Penguin, uh, 50 Famous Australians. I did 50 Notorious Australians <laughs> with the obvious people, Julian Knight, etc. And a librarian of the school, they had a thousand students at the school, um, wrote back to me and said, take me off your database because I treat um, uh, crime in a trivial manner. I trivialise crime, she said, because of the subtitle on Crime Time. You know, Australians behaving badly. So there's a thousand kids that aren't going to get any Fourth Street books yeah. because their librarian has this thing that oh, this publishers are bad publisher. So it wasn't right. even enough that the librarian could say, well, that book's not for us. It, 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 it actually was the entire publishing yeah, company then. I, I sent posters to, you know, I've got a database of about 1,400 people that I sent um, to schools mm -hmm. and what and she said, take me off your diet. Mm -hmm. Does that, um, does that I mean, feedback from one person then change what you do going forward? Does it make you more concerned? Well, well I, I'm publishing, uh, you know, Michael Hunt. You know, Michael oh, Hunt. yeah, very well. Yeah, I've yeah. worked with yeah. a big kid. I'm publishing, a I'm publishing his um, the next book, Footy Dreaming. And he had a lot of expletives in it. And I said, mate, you can't have this and you can't have that. He says, well, why not? I've had the word F-U-C-K in every book of mine. And I said, yeah, but my <coughs> main market is libraries and uh, schools and I said we start putting that in you're not going to sell the book clubs you're not going to sell blah 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 so we whittled him down and whittled him down and it's still a gritty novel but it hasn't yeah. got all those um, I mean I, if I were just publishing if I had this massive publishing house 
I would say, no, I'm publishing this book, it's an novel, and I'm putting this book that this is how these kids will talk. Mm. But I can't have those kids talking like that because I know damn well I'm going to lose my mind. And um, from just, just stepping in in defense of librarians, librarians uh, I often hear are actually quite in favour of children reading a, a broad spread of books that are appropriate for, for the individual, but that often they get a lot of pressure from parents. And well, that's right. One person I was teaching at uh, Marion College, I think it was in Tasmania, and um, they, she was, she loved uh, Matthew Arnold's books, and I think it was Scarecrow was one of his books, and she bought eight copies because the kids loved Matthew Arnold. And uh, one person out of that school, one one parent complained about a scene, and it was a bit of a raunchy scene, I have to say, but that one scene I wouldn't have had if I'd been publishing that book. I would have knocked that out, but they didn't. But suddenly, eight yeah, books. Scarecrow was an adult novel. Yeah, uh, but it's, well, he's, he's, an airport, he, he's an airport. He's uh, an airport. He's an airport book writer, basically. He is an adult writer, but the kids are the ones reading. His main market. Oh, okay. Can, uh, I, can I say something? Yeah, sure. um, I think it, it's very hard when when um, your main area of sales is um, is perhaps a little compromised like that. Mm. Um, but what the kids want to read is is all the stuff that a lot of adults think they don't want to read. <laughs> at the same time, we're saying not enough kids are reading and they need to be reading more. And it's not always the book that we want them to read uh, that opens their minds to what reading can be and takes them into another world. Um, we're fortunate text, I guess, to be a bit less dependent on, on the educational market and we're not. Um, Nothing really gets censored. There'll be occasion, the occasional time where I'll ask an author to consider whether this bit is really necessary. It's always their choice whether uh, something goes in or or, uh, or gets pulled out. Um, but we actually haven't had um, trouble with the educational market. Most of our books are um, picked up in by schools and in and go into school libraries, and some of them. Um, might contain things that you would be surprised to find there. I think it's great that there are, whilst there are difficulties and there are some librarians and schools that will be um, very clear on what they won't have, there's an awful lot of them that are um, very open-minded and kids are getting access to some some great stuff, a lot of sex, I'm afraid, but you know, isn't that what they want? Today's books getting um, no, I don't think we've had book club sales. So this, yeah, yeah. yeah. Book club sales are huge. Yeah. They are. They can buy four thousand copies. Can you elaborate on a, a book club sale? Book clubs uh, um, in Australia, uh, the biggest one I think is Scholastic, mm -hmm. and they might. Um, their the way they operate is they send box their books out every month to all their uh, schools that they subscribe to the system. The librarians in the schools will say, yes, I want this book, this book, this book, and they'll send back those that they don't want. Okay. And then they get billed for the books mm -hmm. that they, they buy. So they, oh, actually, we, we do some last ones through the scholars one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, I, I sent Pretty Dream, and uh, they do this, what they call a Lexile count. And um, the Lexile count actually tells you how many times he used the word crap, how many times <laughs> the word he used shit, how many times, no kidding. She sent me back this oh. thing of uh, the Lexile account of, of all the times that he sort of swore, and I thought, boy, just as well we didn't leave all those other things. Yeah. <laughs> that would have been a whole page of these things. Well, I would like to turn the Lexile account to Feral Tracks. That was censored off a democratically uh, voted young adult novel award list a number of years ago. Hit the papers and all that sort of thing. Right. And uh, what I want to report, well, it was actually about the yeah, in yeah. Western Australia. They went up five five. They were. <laughs> Uh, but what I'd like to add from a writer's point of view, please don't worry about censorship when you're actually writing. The process of writing, write freely, write in your heart. Mm -hmm. and again, that's worry about a legal edit later. Uh, that's the language, language. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And as what we've done with Michael, uh, sort of a language edit, that can be done. But you don't want to be thinking, oh, look, this next sentence might be the end of all my hopes, and I've just write fully and freely, and it can be edited back later. Uh, but, uh, I think too strong to begin with, and it's paired back later. Yeah. yeah, I'm working from the publisher's hat there. <laughs> I might just interrupt you. I think he's got another question coming in from Twitter. So this is from uh, Ad Jeshman Hook. Jeshman Hook. Um, a lot of leeway is given to writers that break the rules but do it well. So I think this is referring to your comment earlier, Jane. How do you know if you are one of those writers? Basically, by submitting a story. Look, I, I've had um, maybe 140 books published um, plus over the years, and I can honestly say not many of them stop on the first, second, or third. 
time I submitted the book. So the one thing I'd tell people, you could you can um, give all the advice in the world to people about how to write, and the one word is persistence. Mm -hmm. So she can tell by sending her story out, because no one can tell her. She can give that story, her novel, to five friends, all of whom are going to tell her it's a great novel and it will be published and their children loved it and blah, blah, blah. It means nothing until you've actually sent it out mm -hmm. and you've got the feedback from the publishers. The publisher will tell you that's a good one. Um, just on that though, with, with the change in the digital market, with, as writers we have more access to <laughs> critique partners now online, but you can you can really find a good match for you online, someone who understands your book, understands the market you're going for and, and can speak to you in a way that it is effective for you to hear. Then there's obviously mentoring, that um, we're, in the, um, we're in a part of the State Library now where Writers Victoria is based and they have a mentoring program. So there's a lot of options available to us as writers now that, that perhaps haven't been in the past to help us get to that point where we're, where we're then submitting. Mm -hmm. But you're right, it's always going to be the publisher who's the, the most critical. Yeah. Well, well it's not exactly the publisher because what the publisher is doing is working out whether there are readers for this book and if, if there are, who they are and whether the publisher can get that book to them because that's that's the role, really. So it's not that the publishers sit still, the editor sits there as the final arbiter on whether your book is good or not good or, or whatever. I mean, the opinion of that of the publisher as a reader is really important, but it's then taking it on. So you could get, you, a lot of books are published over here that aren't very good and that don't do anything. So it's just one step along the way to actually having having a book that that does well. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not saying that a book's no good because you can't get it published. Mm -hmm. Undoubtedly there are thousands of books around the world right at this very moment that are pretty good and they just haven't found the right publisher or the person's given up on them. Yeah. Um, but with, with that idea of persistence though, I think that it's sometimes misconstrued as just needing to keep hounding people. Maybe the persistence is not just in continuing to send it to people because, you know, J.K. Rowling sent it to however many people before she got a publisher and look what happened to her. The persistence has to come into in the actual writing. A lot of, um, I think for a lot of people, and this is so understandable, so much work goes into getting the man to writing the manuscript and you're pouring your soul in and there's hours and hours and years possibly and get to the end of it and think, oh, I feel it's finished, I can't bear to look at it again, I'm sending it off. Um, that's where I think the persistence is, is the big thing. It's not finished um, and it's very hard to go back and look at it again so maybe you need a break from it, maybe it needs to just be put away, not going to be forgotten, but for a time so you can come back fresh and then bring all your persistence, muster every bit you've got, and take it to being your own critical reader and working on, on that manuscript. I mean, a lot of the very successful authors that I, I work with, I don't see their manuscript until they've done an enormous amount of jobs. I know I re um, received one from Kate Bramble once, I think it had drunk 23. <laughs> now, um, as a reader, you want you want to open that book and feel like those words dropped off the end of the, I'm going to say the writer's pen, but mm -hmm. <laughs> the fingertips onto the keyboard just as they are because they're the natural, most perfect mm -hmm. way to put it. But chances are that is so far from mm -hmm. the truth, and there have been rounds and rounds of drafting before an editor's come anywhere near it, um, and then possibly rounds and rounds more. But that persistence, trying to trying to Put that energy into the actual writing um, and get it as good as you can before you use the, you know, the banging on the doors, different kind of persistence. I might just um, jump in there and talk about, just quickly, I'll just go through a list. Um, in Australia, we're still in the fortunate position that as writers we can approach publishers directly and obviously people internationally can approach you directly. Um, but in the States, really, the model is you go to an agent and the agent approaches the publishers. There's really no other there may be exceptions to that rule, but that's generally what's done. Um, agents are becoming more and more vocal about what they don't want to see because they just see too much of it. So I might just run through the list and maybe you can just pick out a couple of, some of the things they list are, pro, they don't want to see prologues, they don't want to see trilogies, they don't want to see prot protagonists looking into mirrors in the first scene, they don't want impotent backstories. Chapter one, which I think you've mentioned already, or that anticlimax 
anticlimactic. Um, they don't want chapter one as a dream sequence, um, too much world building if it's sci-fi, long, flowery, adjective-written sentences, um, character descriptions not working in, um, mundane events. I know we've touched on some of these. Um, they don't want to see a roadmap for the rest of the book. They don't want cheesy hooks. They don't want too much internal reflection. Um, adverbs are a sign of something perhaps not not um, too many adverbs, a sign of, of perhaps a, a problem with the writing. Um, are these things that actually stand out for you as Absolutely. a problem? The client wanted to there sure. had a student once who wrote a first chapter with 42 characters in it. And uh, one of my other students actually went through and counted. Don't, you know, I, I heard the info dump, uh, character description, but don't try and introduce too many characters too quickly in that first chapter. It's true. 42. Okay. That's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. That was so true what you were saying about the writer sees what they submit as finished material. From, mm -hmm. from the editor's point of view, it's raw material, it's mm -hmm. fashion or something. And redrafting doesn't just mean proofreading. It can be reworking a whole thing, putting in different story threads. What was in the middle was now at the start or at the start at the end, and mm -hmm. moving all around. A draft is a huge process to go through. Oh look, I'm just suddenly thinking maybe it was maybe it's seven. <laughs> <laughs> the top of my head, it was a large number. Sure, sure, you know, sure. um, yeah. But yeah. you saying all those uh, things that um, Michelle's just said. Do you, do you often find problems with things like that? Uh, the thing I had about prologues is they're usually in italic to separate them from the rest of the book. Can you find me in a bookshop and pick it up and see a page of italic? Bang, it goes down. Um, <laughs> <laughs> cool uh, and harsh. Um, the first line I read you of this book was the prologue. So I'm not going to say I have a, um, a rule one way or the other. But Do you see too many of them or do you see them mishandled regularly? What, what can happen, I think, is that there are, an, not an easy way, but a, a way of giving uh, readers certain information that the author doesn't want to load up their first chapter with. So you're you sort of just shift, possibly just shifting your problem, a uh, potential problem somewhere else. But I think that whole list of things is really interesting because it, at text every Friday afternoon at 4 o'clock, we sit down at a large table in our boardroom with stacks, several of them, of the unsolicited manuscripts we've come in, and we all sit together and, and read them. And that sort of list could come out of any one of those readings. There's just stuff that you see a lot of going. So, so I think that so it, it is worthwhile then looking at these agents who are being quite vocal about what they don't want to see and keeping it in mind, but, but not entirely restricting yourself. Yeah, look, I think that there's always a problem in saying, don't do this. That you know that could be right for your book. Mm -hmm. I mean, probably overloading it. At, at, Adverbs and adjectives, you know, but they're easy to take out. That's an easy, um, mm -hmm. that's an easy thing. Um, but that whole, a, a, as you read through, say, 20 first four pages or whatever, um, you're going to see things that start, you know, you think, oh, why do they all do this? And then that's how those lists are yes. formed. And and all of those things you, sh you could probably be aware of at your, yeah, at, you know, various points in your drafting. Um, but to sit down to write with that list in front of you, oh, I can't do this, or I better not do that, or I need to do it this way because this is what the list is, is only going to, to wreck it. You're going to end up with something potentially, um, you know, it might tick every box. Yes. There's nothing, I can't see anything that's wrong with this, but there's nothing that's right with it either. So I. Mm -hmm. I don't think you should get too bogged down with that, but maybe at some point in the drafting, when you're up to maybe draft three or four, run your eye down those lists and just see whether you might have lapsed into something that might be um, detracting from. Is it, is, it, is it fair to say it's harder to get a series off the ground now, or that perhaps you might be inundated with, with series coming in when people do approach? Well, the, the um, one thing that uh, they were saying they didn't want dystopian under the mod trilogy as well. If you've got a blanket refusal to look at that, they'd miss out on the Hunger Games, for example. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are going to be exceptions to the rule. I don't think it's really pays any publisher to have mm -hmm. such a blanket rule. So an agent, mm -hmm. uh, because if you read that on agent's website about guidelines and you had just written the Hunger Games, you wouldn't be sending it to that agent. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's a hard one. If um, agents go over to Bologna uh, and sell wide books on children's books every, uh, every year, 
and they come back and say, oh, well, just tokens out, and this is out, and that's <laughs> out. And they go, well, not really. There's, there's still a market there. Mm -hmm. um, I think we might be um, yeah. we might be running out of time. We've, we, we're going over by about 10 minutes, if that's all right, with everyone. Sorry to <laughs> top that on you. Um, so we've got one more question through Twitter, and it's a relatively simple, well, it may not be simple to answer. Um, and then if there's any subsidiary ones after that, then we might wrap up in about five, ten minutes. So this question is from um, from Ad Alison Whip. She's asked, what tips do you have for creating a first chapter with a quiet build of tension? Is there a place for this to, is there a place for this type of start? Well again, that depends on the rest of the novel, doesn't it? Yeah, of course. <laughs> Without reading it. Yeah, of course. I mean it just I think I could sound like a broken down record and say if it's done well and there's a story there mm -hmm. and as Ewan said right at the beginning, a character you feel empathy with, then I really think you can do what you like. Um, is there and is there a guideline for then if you do have a, a slow start, there's not explosions and car crashes, there's it, it's a quiet moment in a protagonist's life, but there's still, as you said, there has to be that tension. Mm -hmm. There has to be a tension or a question or a well, that voice might be there too. It yeah. might be really good writing and a good voice, engaging, and you want to know what happens to this character. It doesn't have actually yeah. have to be action. I mean, most of my stuff is, but <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't mean it else has to. I think too, there's possibly a danger in um, thinking, right, I've got to have a killer first chapter. I'm going to add this and I'm going to add that, and it's going to be whiz bang, and you know, the equivalent of a lot of effects in a movie. And it's like, wow, Russell does it, but. With, you know, you need the heart and the story there, and if that's going to work through a, a quiet build, then that's exactly what you should do. Mm -hmm. yeah, but hanging on, it's got to be that suspense, that question, yeah. that tension, mm -hmm. and it can be very detailed. Characters can be built up for a, for a long time, but there's sort of with a sense there is tension and some sort of drama. Mm -hmm. And menace is a good word. It's often talked about in short stories, a sense of menace or foreboding. Mm -hmm. um, but if... You want that quiet, uh, it, sometimes I like think happy or carefree start. It may be because then, bang, chapter two, something really bad is going to happen. And that's a common thing. Just when everything is looking fantastic, the whole world falls apart. But there you've got that drama and that sudden mm -hmm. drop. But I think, too, in the, just the way the, the sentences are formed, the way they're put together, there'll be a command in there that'll be obvious, uh, hopefully from the first well, few sentences. Um, and if there are obvious spelling mistakes all over the place, it's, it's not a good mm -hmm. thing. Having said that, I've seen some brilliant writing, but there are problems with the spelling. You think, well, don't worry, we'll just fix it mm -hmm. with the editor, whatever. There's got to be that heart, that humanity, uh, whatever it is. Uh, but if, if there are just repeated mistakes all over the place, if they have mm -hmm. with uh, spell check, I think. Yeah. It's, it really is pushing the buttons of so many publishers, and I have an editorial background. Some publishers have a background in sales, and that they can be great at picking the gap in the market and all that sort of thing. But so many publishers have an editorial background. You're pushing those buttons, and you have got all those typos in there. It's, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and just quickly, if I can go on to it, um, we've been through the list of don'ts. In terms of the list of do's, some of them I've already um, talked about. A killer first line, a hook, but perhaps not too much hook or not, not to be overly um, obsessed by it. Um, an inciting incident, pace, um, how pacey it needs, something needs to be, the tone. You've talked about the tightness already. Um, and, and the plot, do you, do you want to talk about some things that you'd really, you'd really love to see? Well, I think that you shouldn't try and run too much electricity through a wire. It's going to melt down. That's the first thing. So, kill it first, Jack. Oh, God. Uh, okay, but look, I'll tell you something that really goes down well. I've noticed in so many books a really well placed original simile. It might be, you know, as rough as, and you're waiting for something collegial like bags or guts or something, as rough as, and it might be something like as public toilet paper or something like that. You know, it's a nice term of phrase. Now, that's a fairly sort of commonplace. But it was, you know, going back to Aristotle, he was a guy who said, you want to know if a writer's got the genius behind them, like Sophocles and all these people he'd name, look at their use of metaphor. And uh, I mean metaphor isn't similar as well. You can have fun with them, don't just think they're a device for poets. Uh, Van is a very good one, one of my favourite ones is Shane Lane, he's one of the text organs. Busier than a concert pianist, one arm concert pianist, with crabs. And I thought it was just great. So you, you don't think of those serious poetic devices. Mm -hmm. So, so, so a good simile thrown there just shows, oh, original term phrase. Mm -hmm. so that would be something that I like to say. Completely enlightening of that 
moment or that character in just those few words. It's fantastic. But I can't stop thinking about that pianist <laughs> hurrying between the keyboard and somewhere else. <laughs> and, and sorry, yes, I was just going to say that Philip really um, does the um, mortal, engine, uh, mortal engines. He is fantastic with similes. I actually you know, I have a list of them I read out to kids because they went, he's brilliant. He's about the best writer I've ever come across. Mm -hmm. Those similes are just so original. They can really arrest you just like you put it up and what, what, what yeah, is yeah. Yeah, you have a few of those gems scattered around it, so yeah. can you hide a few sort of minor flaws? Because <laughs> 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 you think it's great. Uh, I want to ask Les Murray what is good writing now. He's a, he primarily a poet, he's written a lot of prose, and he actually used that word arrest me and said, writing, good writing is writing that arrests you at suitably spaced intervals. Mm. <laughs> That's a great definition, I've never forgotten that. Um, so you know, it's very handy to have that original turn of phrase up this way. Mm -hmm. um, that's probably mm -hmm. a wonderful point to, to finish on. Mm -hmm. And um, thank you for your um, assistance today on, on how to captivate the reader and, and pull them through that first chapter. And, and also not to be too obsessed about the, about the don'ts and actually just the, the freedom to tell your story and, and the confidence to tell your story. Mm -hmm. Um, were there any more questions from? No. Okay. So, well, um, thank you very much to the Digital Writers Festival and the Emerging Writers Festival for hosting us. Um, uh, and we're part of Freshly Squeezed Freeze and we're hosting a chapter one contest at the moment. And there are three categories to win. So there'll be a category as judged by industry professionals. And um, Ewan's um, uh, pleasingly come on board as one of our industry professionals. And then there'll be a writers category as well and a, and a category as judged by teenagers. Um, and we're, we're really looking forward to it. It's going to be a, a great competition. We hope you come on board. The submissions are, are open now. And um, yeah, we'll hope to see you later in the festival. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much for your Thanks, time. Michelle. Thank well. you.